system of linear equations has the same solution as the one shown below. So there's a couple of ways to handle it. One way is the probably the really tedious way, and that would be to solve the given system and then solve each of the choices and see which ones coincide. That that takes a while. So if if it's kind of a last resort situation, then by all means go for it. But that should that should be saved for a last resort situation. All right? So two lines are equal or equivalent if one is a multiple of the other all right so two lines are equivalent if one is a multiple of the other all right so i, I could just show you really quickly Uh, probably better to show on Desmos. I'll just show you a quick example. Let's say you have 2x plus y equals 7 and 4x plus 2y equals 14. All right. One is a multiple of the other. They both go to the same location. All right? They're both equivalent. One is equivalent to the other. All right? So we could look for that. That's one possibility. All right? If you add two equations together, that new equation will have the same intersection as the two original equations. All right? So if you add two equations the result will have the same solution as the original pair so basically it'll intersect in the same locations all right. So those are two key ingredients whenever you see a question like this. So let's say I have two lines that I know cross each other. If I add the two equations, I'm going to get a different line, but that third line would have to cross at the same intersection point. All right. Different line, but same solution. All right. So these are the things that we would look for. So off the bat, I see choice four has the same equation as the original example, all right? So that's a good place to get started, all right? So I can add the two equations together, but remember, subtraction is a special form of addition. So if I take x minus 4y equals negative 10 and add to it x plus y equals 5, I'll get 2x plus, uh, minus 3y is equal to negative 5, but that's not a choice, all right? So instead what I could do is I could basically do the same thing except with subtraction, all right? So make this a minus, x minus x, zero, negative 4y, Oops. Negative 4y minus another y would be negative 5y. Negative 10 minus 5 would be negative 15. All right. So that's almost there. All right. So it looks close to this, but not quite. So we look for another choice. All right. We know that each of the remaining choices all have an x plus y equals 5. So x plus y equals 5 is consistent across the board. So now I'm looking for another possibility that would, that would play itself out. So if I could, like in this case here, how I just subtracted the two equations, 
I might consider subtracting or adding them in such a way that the y variable cancels out. All right. So starting with the x minus 4y equals negative 10, I can take the second equation and multiply each part by a 4. That'll give me a 4x plus 4y equals 20. So that gives me 5x is equal to 10, which is one of the other equations. So that's this one right here, making this the, making this the choice. All right, so it, this one's a, a tricky question because you can add the equations, you can subtract the equations, you can throw in a multiplier and then add them, or worst case scenario, like I said, put them all in your calculator and see which ones have the same solution as the original. The thing is, you're gonna have to do a little bit of extra algebra along the way, all right? So it can be frustrating, but it is manageable. A third approach would be to use test values, all right? So let's say you, you, you think this is a waste of time, you wanna, you wanna go about it a different way, but you're willing to test all, the, all the, the choices. What you can do is make up a reasonable value for x and a different reasonable value for y and plug it into every one of the possibilities. Right? And see which ones check out. All right? They should end up giving a, an equivalent relationship. All right? So that's another possibility. But yeah, that, that one's a tricky one because there's a lot going on there. All right, do you want me to just go through or do you have specific questions? Start off with number one and just right on down the line? Yeah. All right. All right, so number one, Brian's hockey team is, a, is purchasing jerseys. Company charges $250 for a one-time setup fee. So that's a fixed amount. and $23 for each printed jersey. All right. If X represents the number of jerseys, then 23 times X would be the amount that you'd have to pay in total for jerseys. So this one would be 250 plus 23 times X. All right, so the fixed amount plus the variable quantity, all right? The for each part of it makes this 23, makes that the slope. The fixed amount corresponds with the y intercept. So in the form of y equals a, x, a plus bx, you would get this equation. And so this corresponds with choice three. So I'm writing a lot of extra details that you wouldn't have to write just to kind of make sure you understand the concept. But it does tie together with our, our knowledge of linear equations. Two ways to identify whether a relation is a function. One way is graphing and seeing if it passes the vertical line test. or check to see if any single x value corresponds to more than one y value. All right, so if it passes the vertical line test, that would make it a function. If the x value corresponds to more than one y value, then it's not a function. All right, so you're kind of like, we're using different tests in different ways, but it's ultimately gonna give us the same thing. All right, they're looking to see which one is a function. So basically, I'm going to identify which one is not, not a function. 
right? So in choice three, for example, I see negative three corresponds to zero, but it also corresponds to two. So that can't be a function. In number two, one corresponds to four different things. One corresponds to two, three, four, and five. In number one, two corresponds to negative three, but it also corresponds to one. So neither of these are functions, meaning the four has to be the only one that is a function. And if you, if you graph them, it, it, it becomes pretty obvious. I'll, I'll just take one for example, or one, one data table for example, and just plot. So here's negative three, zero, here's negative two, one, negative three, two, and then two, three. All right, so if I draw a vertical line and sweep it through the graph, I would just be checking to see if it ever intersects in more than one location. And you know, my crappy drawing aside, it does intersect in more than one location here. All right, so that would make this one, for example, not a function. All right, so you check that in multiple cases, which makes it you know, time consuming, but it is manageable. All right, number three, which expression is equivalent? So it's asking us to do some basic algebra here. All right, that basic algebra is involving the distributive property. So I'm gonna take the two and distribute it to each term here. I'm going to take that positive 3x and distribute it to each term there. So I'm looking at 2x squared minus 2 plus 3x squared minus 12x. I got some like terms here. 5x squared. We want to put it in descending order. Highest, highest exponent comes first, then the next highest, next highest, and so on. All right, so minus 12x minus 2. When it comes to, oh, that's choice four, by the way. When it comes to solving equations, there's a couple of approaches that you can use. Uh, one would be to actually solve it algebraically. The other is using uh, a graphing calculator technique that I'll show you in a sec. But let me, let me do the algebra first. We're looking at a proportion here, right? Fraction equal to fraction. Single fraction on the left, single fraction on the right. So we can cross multiply. So three times x plus 10 would be equal to four times 15. All right, so distribute the three, three x plus 30 is equal to 60. Subtract the 30. 3x is equal to 30. Divide by the 3. You don't have to show really any of this work. It's multiple choice. Just looking for the answer. x would be equal to 10. All right. But I'm taking you through the steps just in case it's a free response question. All right. Part 2, 3, and 4, you got to show all your work. Part, part two questions, they, they should only require maybe one or two steps worth of work. Part three questions, two to three, three to four steps, two to, really two to four steps. But then part, the part four question is usually around 10 steps because it's multiple parts to the question. So you'll have part A, part B, part, B, part C, each one having three to four steps. Right. So more elaborate as you go on. Right. Now let me show you how you can do this on the, on the graphing calculator. Right. So what you would do, anytime you're given an equation, you can put the left-hand side of that equation in as y1, and you can put the right-hand side in as y2. You can go either order on that, it doesn't make a difference. So in y equals, 
four thirds, and then x plus 10 over uh, 15, so alpha y equals, for the older calculators, newer ones have different, different shortcut keys. All right, so x plus 10 up top, 15 on the bottom. All right, now because, because we're looking at clean answers here, we, we know they're clean answers because it's multiple choice question and not one of them is a disgusting decimal. All right, you can go to the table, All right? So second graph, second graph is what I wanted to do. There we go. And just look for any instance in which the, X, uh, the Y1 and Y2 values are the same, All right? The issue is when I put in the four thirds as a division, it puts my Y1 values as decimal, whereas if I use the fraction tool, it'll put it in simplest fraction form. So to make it a little bit more convenient, an option that you could use would be putting this in as four thirds, using the fraction shortcut, then go into your table, and it, it should be a little bit more obvious where your intersection is. So you start off at zero, for example, and you just kind of work your way down the line, and you see once you get to 10, the result is four thirds, so you know you're good, all right? So that's one approach, but then you might look at it and say, well, that's great when you have nice, clean answers. What if you don't? Well, there's another option. There's always another option. You could use the intersect, all right? So if I do a zoom six, I have the two graphs showing up on the screen. It's, it's not pretty, but they're, th they're there. You can always use the zoom fit function, all right? So looking at the choices, I see that the lowest number is negative six, the largest number is, is a 30. So what I would do in my, in my window is I would choose a number for x min that's less than the smallest choice, all right? The x max, I would make that a number that's bigger than the biggest choice, so like 35 or 40, I'll put 40. And then for the Y max, clear, zoom, zero. All right, so now you have, I mean, it's not crystal clear, but you have a good window here. It's going from zero to 3.3 .3 repeated. That 3.3 .3 repeated is, is definitely bigger than we need it to be. Right, so we're, we're in, the, in the right area. So when you go into your graph, you could do second trace five, enter, 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 right? And so the X value would be 10, right? Which is what we would be looking for here, right? The graph, the graph looks kind of weird because this kind of looks like it's the X axis, but this is actually the horizontal line Y equals four over three. This down here with all the tick marks there, that's the X axis. So we have a clean intersection here, the slanted line and the horizontal line. So we're just looking for that intersection, all right? So you would store the left-hand side in as Y1, the right-hand side in as Y2, all right? Then you could use the intersect. Alternatively, alternatively, so this way might be the best option out of all of them. You could use the solver function on the calculator. So math, and you'll see at the bottom of the, the display, it'll either say solver or numeric solver. Right, if you hit enter on that, uh, you know what, most of you have the, uh, the newer calculator, so let me do that, let me change it over. I'm just going to pop it in real quick. Yeah, the newer software um, has a different looking interface. So you have your equations in. It's numeric solver right at the bottom. Now, it, it might say solver, depending on the model, it might say solver or numeric solver, all right? But then you'll see 
two windows here, one that says E1 and the other for E2, equation one, equation two, all right? So I would set this up so that it's alpha trace Y2, Y1 and Y2, I want those to be equal to one another. So if you go to solve, if you hit the down arrow and then hit alpha enter, so not just enter, it's not just gonna spit out the right answer without you doing an extra step. It's kind of annoying, but it is what it is. If you hit alpha enter, it'll give you the solution to the problem, except in this case, I think I typed in something wrong. Yeah, that was supposed to be a 10. So again, math, numeric solver, Y1, Y2, and then hit the down arrow till you're in the X equals field and hit alpha enter. And it'll just tell you what the, what the X value is of the intersection. All right, so that's another function that you could use. In this case, you probably didn't, you wouldn't need it, but you know, it's for, for more elaborate cases, you know, just imagine a problem where maybe you have to solve using the quadratic formula, you know, something pretty complicated to know that you can get the decimal answer pretty quickly is not, not really that, uh, it's not really that complicated of a process. So, you know, it's pretty useful. So anyway, if anybody needs help with uh, that function later, I can, I can go over it again. Number five, Josh graphed the function. He then graphed the other function. He wants, uh, wants to know what the, the vertex of G of X is gonna be, all right? So it's kind of a, kind of a strange way of asking the question because it makes it seem like you're just gonna be asked to state what the vertex is, but it's, it's really asking how that vertex relates to the vertex of the original function, all right? So if you're looking at this one, I mean, you could do it on a graphing calculator but you can also pull the vertex right out of the equation. So the vertex here is one negative five. And for my f of x, the vertex is one, two. All right, so they're just asking what the relationship is between these two vertices. All right, so one's at one, two, the other's at one negative five. The X value's not changing, it's the Y value, so we'll just ditch these two bad boys. No, we always flip the sign. Yeah, flip the sign of the number in the parentheses, keep the sign of the number that's outside. All right. So one, two, two units above the X axis going down to one negative five, that's five units below the X axis, must have moved down seven units. Okay, you draw a quick sketch of it, but the second graph is seven units below the first one. All right, that's, it's nice to be able to do it that way because it's quick, very straightforward. It's a it's fact-based question, but you could also get away with doing it in your calculator. If you type in the original f of x, and the g of x, take a look at the picture, the standard zoom will do the trick here. The first graph is blue, that's my f of x, my f of x is in blue, my g of x is in red. It looks like the red is below. Really, I don't even need to count because they're, they're both, both choices involve seven units. So it's a question of which one's below and which one's above, all right, so pretty easy in the calculator, but the thing is, it's actually easier or quicker to do it by hand than it is to even type it into the calculator. So, you know, just be strategic when you use the calculator, All right? A survey was given to 12th graders of West High School to determine the location for the senior class trip. Results are in the table below. Nearest percent 
what percent of the boys chose Niagara Falls. So just specifically focusing on the boys. So ignoring everyone else. Just run the, the numbers here. We got 56, 74, and 103. There's a total of 233 boys in this group. All right, so if you create a total, 233. They want to know what percent chose Niagara Falls. Uh, the number that chose Niagara Falls would be 56 out of the 233. Because again, it's saying of the boys. So we don't, we don't care about anyone else here. All right. Convert it over to a percent, 56 out of 233. Decimal form is 0.24. So that's going to be about 24%. This is one of those um, topics that was in the Unit 10 packet, the first 14 pages. If you haven't had a chance to review that stuff, definitely take some time. All right. Type of function. Well, it's definitely not a line. If you're not sure, then just type in the different types of functions and have a quick look. Process of elimination is going to get you to an exponential fairly quickly because you know it's not a line. If you don't remember what a square root function looks like, go to y equals and type in a square root function. Any, any square root function you want, keep it simple. Go with the parent. Square root of x, zoom 6, that's what a square root function looks like. Absolute value function. Alpha window for absolute, I'm oh, sorry, alpha window for absolute value. Go with the parent function, see what that one looks like. That's the V-shaped curve, it's certainly not that. So it's gotta be the exponential. Again, just by process of elimination. Number eight's factoring problem. The first thing I check whenever I'm dealing with a factoring question is to see if it's, fa if the choices are factored completely, right? Because every now and then you'll see a choice that couldn't possibly be the answer based off of how factored it is. Now this one doesn't say which one is the factored form, it's just saying which one's equivalent. So it, you gotta be careful about that because anything goes. But the key to this kind of problem is identifying what sort of factoring question it is. All right, so our possibilities are trinomial. That's three terms, so it's not that a GCF type question, which you should always check for, or a difference of perfect squares. All right, And then a subcategory of trinomial is that it could be a perfect square trinomial. But again, that's not relevant here because we have only two terms. So I check to see if there's a GCF, there isn't. Right? But it's worth it to take the time to review how you do that on the calculator. So that was in that um, TI-84 uh, study guide that I gave you, but it's math, NUM, uh, GCD. All right, so math, NUM, GCD. That's only going to account for the coefficients. It's not going to take into account the variables. All right, so. If I'm not sure, I type in 16 comma 81. It says the greatest common factor is one. That's the trivial case. It doesn't bring anything new to the party. So we're not worried about the GCF. We know that it's not a trinomial. So it must be a difference of perfect squares. If it's factorable at all, but because all four choices involve factors, we know we're in good shape, all right? The process for difference of perfect squares is that you take the square root of the first term, take the square root of the last term, and alternate the signs. So the rule itself, a squared minus b squared, is equal to a minus b, a plus b. <coughs> the 
you'll have enough time on the exam where if you get jammed up on a question like this, you can brute force your way to the answer. It's just tedious, but you can get it done. Like, let's say I completely forgot how to factor on the day of the region. So tomorrow, tomorrow, right? Yeah, it's crazy. Happens so quickly. Um, what you could do is type in the original expression and then type in each of the choices and see which one is equivalent, all right? So I'm just gonna jump right to the correct one. All right, so you could look at the picture if you want, but I recommend going to the table. So if you hit second graph, the Y columns should be identical. If they're identical, then you're looking at two equivalent expressions. All right. There's drawbacks to everything, which is why I was saying before about the idea of factoring completely. Sometimes a question says, which one is factor, the, the completely factored form of whatever the expression is? You could end up with something that's equivalent, but not factored enough. All right. So you just got to be careful, but it, it's, it's a good way to give you a sense of equivalence. All right. So that was choice three. Number nine, the owner of a landscaping business wants to know how much time on average his workers spend mowing one lawn. What is the appropriate rate with which to calculate an answer to his question? All right, so it's a question about slope. All right, so how much time you spend mowing the lawn? So basically it's asking, are we talking about seconds per lawn? lawns per second, minute, whatever. So the key ingredient there is time. So anything that doesn't involve time, I'm gonna toss, all right? So lawns per employee, no. Employees per lawn, no. So it's lawns per day or hours per lawn, all right? So they're asking, how much time on average, right? So, sorry, kind of went cross-eyed there for a second. Since the key ingredient is time, what we want would want to know is the time as the numerator per unit of whatever else, all right? So yeah, lawns per day involves time, but that's gonna give us the number of lawns as a result, all right? So the result here is number of lawns. The result here is number of hours. Yeah, it's per something else, but the key ingredient is that it, lawns for number two, hours for number four, since he's concerned, yeah, he, is concerned with number of, or, or time, uh, number of hours makes the most sense, all right? Number 10, how many seconds after being thrown will the ball hit the ground? The ground is when height is equal to zero. You can do this a bunch of different ways. Again, multiple choice question, you have your choice. So this is saying zero is equal to negative 16 T squared plus 64 T plus 80. You could solve it by factoring if you want, right? But again, it's multiple choice, so you shouldn't need to, all right? So if you, like I did before, I'll do it both ways. If you do it by factoring, I notice that there's a GCF here. And if you're not sure, use the GCD function. All right, so you just, you have to go two terms at a time though. So 16 and 64, the GCD between 16 and 64 is 16. So then use that 16 against the 80 and you'll see it's still a 16. So I can factor out a 16, but I also want my leading coefficient to be positive. So I'm gonna take out a negative 16 instead. Dividing each term by negative 16 gives me a result of t squared minus 4t 
minus five. So that's a trinomial. So good opportunity to review that idea. All right. So I'm going to take the t's and put them in the first position because the most logical way to get to a t squared would be t and t. All right. Then I need to get to a five. Since five is a prime number, it would have to be five and one. It's just a question of which one is negative. All right, so for that, I use my outer and inner products. Right now, assuming they're both positive, I'd have five T and one T. Adding them together, that would give me a six T. I need it to be a four T, negative four T, sorry. All right, so in order for that to play out, this would have to be negative, this would have to be positive. So minus plus, all right? So zero product property, take each of my factors and set them equal to zero. Zero can't be equal to negative 16, so let's toss that. Zero can be equal to t minus five. Zero can be equal to t plus one. Solve each one of those. t equals five, t equals negative one, all right? Now, because this object's being thrown from the top of a building, we're looking at something like this. And you got... There was some moment in time, or there could have been, I suppose, prior to the ball being thrown, where it could have been on ground level, but there's a significant obstruction in the way, and that would be the building. So here's where time t equals zero. Here's where time t is equal to five. All right, so the ball must have been in the air for five minus zero seconds, so five seconds. Just like that proportion question, there's like five other ways to do this one. I'll just show you one of them. If the numbers are clean, and again, you could tell by the choice whether the numbers are clean. You could just go into the table. So negative 16x squared instead of t plus 64x plus 80. Go into the table second graph. See when y1 is equal to 0. That happens when x is equal to 5, so 5 seconds. 5 minus the 0 gives you a 5. And again, you subtract because it, it, it's not always the case that the clock stop, uh, starts when the ball is being thrown. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is extra help. You go to the bathroom whenever you want. You go twice if you want. So, yeah. It, let, let's say, for example, somebody's starting a stopwatch and they let 5 seconds go go before they throw the ball, right? And then they determine that the ball hits the ground at the 15 second mark. That means that the ball was in the air for 10 seconds. Because five seconds, the ball wasn't doing anything. Then it traveled for another 10 seconds to get us to 15 seconds, all right? So that's another way you can handle it. You can also use a solver for this one too. Um, which equation is equivalent? Same idea as really any other question where I said that there's multiple approaches. You could do it by hand, you could do it with a calculator. If you're doing it by hand, you're gonna have to use multiple steps. So completing the square, axis symmetry, find the vertex, and, you know, so that, that's a possibility. But what I would recommend in this instance is look at the original function and see if you could pull out the vertex from there. All right, so you put the original function into your calculator and see if you can identify where that vertex is. Just make sure I typed it in correctly. You should have symmetry in your y column, all right? So it looks like it's, so if I start at negative 10, it looks like it's decreasing. I'm sorry, it looks like it's increasing. Then... Once it, well, actually, maybe not. Maybe it's the other way. 
It looks like it's increasing without restriction there. So let's go the other way. So decreasing, decreasing, decreasing. Oh, then it turns around and starts increasing again. So it looks like it's decreasing until it gets to, if I'm going bottom to top, until we get to negative 12, negative 162, and then it starts increasing again. All right, so at this location here, we have a turning point. The axis of symmetry, negative 12, so that eliminates these two choices. The K value is negative 162, so that makes this choice one. All right, so if you pull the vertex from this equation, negative 12, negative 162, you can match that up with the, uh, the vertex form. All right. Uh, number 12, when that expression is written as a polynomial in standard form. Okay, so we're gonna do a little work here. So we're gonna apply a little distributive property. I recommend multiplying the binomials first and then multiplying through with the x. So this, we're looking at 2x squared. The outer terms will be plus 3x. The inner term is negative 10x, and then negative 15. Simplify 2x squared minus 7x minus 15. And then I'm going to multiply through with the x. We don't want to forget that. Although, you could actually stumble onto the right answer even if you do miss a step. But that's pretty rare. Distribute 2x to the third power minus 7x squared minus 15x. All right, the constant term is any term that doesn't have a variable. All right, so constant means no variable. All right, the leading coefficient is the coefficient of the term with the highest power. The degree, the degree is the highest power. And I think the last one's obvious, number of terms. All right, so there, there is no constant term. Every term has a variable attached. The leading coefficient is two, so that's the correct one. The degree, the highest power is three, so that's not right. The number of terms is three, so that's not right. So this is saying take your regression equation and set it equal to zero and solve. So that's in your y equals. For your second equation, you want that to be zero. The first one will be your regression equation, which you'll have to just redo. And yeah, and then you're going to find the intersection. That, that'll give you these two values. If you find the intersection between your regression equation and zero, it'll give you these two numbers. So let me just do that. They'll, they'll both be x values because there's going to be two intersections. So you'd have to find them both. All right. Number 13, exponential. Which function is approximately equivalent, right? So it's like a lot of the other questions where you can, you can brute force it in a calculator or you can apply some fact that hopefully you know, but if it escapes you in the moment, then you always have to just type it right into the calculator and see which one matches up, right? But this can be written, this expression here is the key to the whole thing. P of t can also be written as 3810 times 1.0005 to the seventh power to the t power. So when you raise a power to a power, you multiply the exponents.
It was like unit five. So it was like half a year ago. If you have a power to a power, you multiply the powers. But what we're doing here is we're actually going in the opposite direction. All right? So if the powers are already multiplied, you can break them apart all right, by factors. All right? So that 1.0005 raised to the seventh power would become the new base of the exponential. So this would be the same as 3810 times, if I go three significant on this, it would be 1.00351 to the T power. All right, the closest choice to that would be choice two. All right, number 14, for which value of x is f of x not equal to g of x? Well, f of x is equal to g of x at the intersection points. All right, so I have an intersection here at two, here at negative one, and here at negative two. So I have three intersection points, particularly the x values of the intersection points. So negative two is where, is one of the locations at which the two functions are the same. So is negative one and so is positive two. The one instance where they're not the same would be the x value of three, all right? Because at the x value of three, we have this location here, the, graph, the graphs are not coinciding with one another. Because at three, the graphs are not intersecting. Right. The range of a data set, it's going back to sixth grade now. It's, it's weird, I don't know why they do this. It's like, it, it's, this exam I guess is the culmination of the first 10 years of like your education in math, I don't know. But it's part of the sixth grade curriculum yet it shows up on this exam. Whatever, it's not a bad question. The range of any data set is equal to the maximum value minus the minimum value. Right? The five important values in a box plot, minimum, the first quartile, also known as the lower quartile, the median, the third quartile, also known as the upper quartile, and the maximum. All right, so the range in this case would be eight minus one, which is seven. Right. But if you know those features of the box plot, you can pick out anything. Right. And just so I address it, in case we don't have time to do a problem like this later, if a question asks you for the interquartile range, that's Q3 minus Q1. All right. Didn't ask it here, but you can easily pick out the interquartile range. Uh, what's the deviant? I don't know about What's the what? The oh, the deviation? That, that would be uh, the interquartile range in this case. So, but there's also a standard deviation, which I can, if it's not in this exam, I'll, I'll make up a problem or find a problem. It's towards the end. Okay. Yeah, that's all calculator work. I'll show you how to do that. Uh, which expression is not equivalent, right? So it's another factoring problem. I mean, it's an, it's an algebra exam, so you expect that there's gonna be some algebra involved. Although with the multiple choice questions, you can get away without doing algebra. So it's kind of a double-edged thing, right? But in this case, I see a GCF, right? The GCF is equal to two. 
So I could factor that out. Oh, for the y-intercept, you just go into the table and see, ah, there it is. You see when the x value is here. That's much easier. All right, so I'm looking at 2 times x squared plus 5x plus 6. Now, choice 4 has a GCF, but that doesn't mean that the rest of it is correct. All right, so we still got to check. All right, I, I suspect that it's two and three. I mean, most of the choices have a two and a three in it in some capacity, all right? And I'm just gonna double check to make sure it, it checks out. If they're both positive, we'll get, that, we'll get that sum of five X. So we're in good shape there. Just bring down that GCF, two times X plus two times X plus three, all right? So that one checks out, but they're saying which one is not equivalent, all right? So I'll toss that one every other choice has to be some kind of variation of this answer all right so if you take the two times x plus two and distribute the two to just the x plus two you'll get two x plus four which is also a choice that's choice one if you take the two and distribute it to the x plus three and leave the x plus two alone you'll get 2x plus 6 and x plus 2. Also a choice. So by process of elimination, it would be choice 3. Alternatively, if you have a sense of what you think the right answer is, now that's not always the case. Sometimes you, you go into a problem, you have no idea. You can start distributing. You know, distribute the choices out and see which one gives you the expression you started with. All right? Because factoring is just a reverse of the distributive property. So if you're given four choices, you can brute force your way to the answer by distributing them all out and seeing which one corresponds to the given expression. Alternatively, alternatively, you put all five expressions in your calculator and see which one gives you a different graph. All right, so that, that's always an option when it comes to multiple choice. Question. Well, in this case, what you're given is an expression that's already in expanded form. So the only thing you could do is factor. Okay? And the first type of factoring technique, or the first factoring technique that we look for is the GCF. Okay? But because it's a trinomial, that's why we broke it up into two uh, sets of binomials. But it's really, you just kind of look at what you have if it's in factor form, you distribute it out. If it's in distributed form, you factor it out. Number 17, quadratic functions R and X are given below. So R is in the table. Oh, sorry, R and Q. And Q is given as an equation. So they want to know which one's going to have the smallest minimum value. So for this one, we have a vertex here. every other number is larger than that value, all right? So this negative 16 must be the minimum. All right, for the other one, you could go about it a couple ways. I feel like I say that for every problem, but it's true. You can solve it, by, meaning get it into vertex form, identify what the vertex is and go from there which isn't really solving it, I'm kind of misspoke, but you know, do it algebraically. Or put it in your calculator, take a look at the picture, or put it in your calculator, take a look at the table. Oh, because every other number, it's, it's, it's a turning point, but every other number is bigger than it. So I go to the table here, second graph, and I'm looking for the vertex. So I'm looking for where the graph turns around upon itself. 
It looks like it happens right here. All right, so this one has a vertex of negative one, negative nine. All right. This one has a leading coefficient. The A value is greater than zero. So it's an upward facing parabola. So this one must be the minimum. So one of them has a minimum of negative 16. The other has a minimum of negative nine. All right, so we want to know which one has the smallest minimum. Well, negative 16 is smaller than negative 9. So we're looking at r of x being the correct one. And the value is negative 16. Oh, because that's the middle value in the table. There, there is another way to do it, but I, I, I'd say it's probably unnecessarily complicated. It involves quadratic regression. So I, I think this is probably the most user-friendly approach. If anybody wants to see an alternative method for this, I'll, I'll show you later. Uh, number 18. The child's playing outside the graph below shows the child's distance, D of T, in yards from home over a period of time, T, in seconds. All right, so distance versus time. Which interval represents the child constantly moving closer to home? All right, so that would be any instance in which, well, the distance is getting smaller, but also at a constant rate of change. So that would be this piece right here. All right, so going from zero to two. All right, and that's because the slope is, let's see, negative six over two, negative three at any point on the line segment. Right, not to be confused with this little piece here, going from here to here. All right, because this this is another instance where the the individual is moving closer to home, but depending on where you are on that curve, you're going to have a different slope. So if you're at this location, you're going to have a slope that looks like this. If you're at this location, you're going to have a slope that looks like that. The slope is changing. The slope is changing depending on where you are on the curve, but the one that I highlighted in yellow, the slope is always the same no matter where you are on that line. All right, so that's the interval of zero to two. All right. They didn't play around with the inequalities here, but you got to imagine that they could open circles, which didn't come into play here. You're using greater than or less than closed circles greater than or equal, less than or equal. Right? These are all closed circles and all the choices had less than or equal to symbols in it. So they didn't, they didn't get cute with that, but they, they could have. All right. Uh, number 19 is a recursive situation, a recursive model. All right. it, it looks like it's quadratic, but whenever you're dealing with recursion, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You're just following the recipe that they put in front of you. They want us to determine A of two, A sub two, A of two. <coughs> following this form here, replacing every N with a two, I get three plus two times A sub two minus one squared, which is the same as saying three plus two times A sub one squared and they told us that a sub one is equal to six. So three plus two times 36, 72, 
75. And again, multiple choice, you just need the answer. You don't have to show any of that work. This is just for your benefit. All right. All right, little uh, word problem, kind of a mini word problem. They save the more elaborate ones for the uh, free response section. But when you get to something like this, it's really just asking how would you define the, the, the equation. Length of the rectangular patio is seven more than its width W, right? So rectangle, we're saying the width is W, the length is seven more than that. The area, area is equal to length times width. So seven plus W times W, right? Just distribute it out. But at this point, we're in the neighborhood of like, or in the realm of process of elimination, where you could say, well, there's no way this is gonna equal this, this, or this, but you could also distribute it out and get the choice two anyway. Number 21, a dolphin jumps out of the water, then back into the water, all right? Yeah, that's fine. All right, dolphin jumps out of the water and then back into the water. His jump could be graphed on a set of axes where X represents time and Y represents distance above or below sea level. The domain for the graph is best represented using Y. You know, so it, it makes it seem like you're, you're on the hook for creating a graph or maybe solving a word problem, but it's really just asking to make a statement about the domain this is all possible values of x. All right, so x in this case represents time. All right, so we just wanna know how time can be measured. Can time only be measured in integers? No, all right, because you, you can have you can have decimals when it comes to time, all right? Integer values negative infinity to infinity, but only going in whole value increments. So, like negative ten, negative nine, negative eight, and so on, and then getting into the positives twenty one, twenty two, twenty three, and so on, all right? Doesn't account for any decimals. So we ditch anything that has integers in it. We would ditch anything that has whole numbers in it. Uh, real numbers, the real number system, that allows for negatives. Now you gotta think whether or not negative values make sense in the context of the problem, all right? So it's, a, it's really more of a question of what's most likely to be the domain for this, all right? It's most likely the case that we would care about positive real numbers, not the negative ones, because real numbers in general allow for negatives. We only wanna focus on the positives, all right? So 22 we did before, uh, 23, which interval represents the range of the function? The range is all possible values of y. All right, so I can go into my calculator, take a look at the picture. So possible values of y are really talking about how low can it go, how high can it go? Not how left can it go, how right can it go? So I'll put in 2x squared minus 2x minus 4. I could go into the table or I could look at the picture. In this case, let me start off with looking at the picture. All right, because you could get a good idea of what's happening with the graph in this particular instance, just by looking at the picture, it looks like it goes down, but only so far, then it goes up forever. So, and, and looking at the choices that bears out, every choice has it going up forever, all right? So all of these infinities mean that it goes up forever. All right, now I just need to know how far down it goes. If I count the tick marks, one, two, three, four, 
Eh, four and a half. I went cross-eyed there for a second because I was like, wait a minute, did they put two identical choices? Well, you can actually get to the negative 4.5, so that makes choice four the, the correct answer. All right, parentheses, exclude the value, exclusive, no, exclude the given value, brackets, include all right so since there's no open circle for example at that vertex we know that we can go down actually touch that point and before we go back up all right number 24 what is a common ratio of the geometric sequence whose first term is five and third term is 245. Bunch of different ways to do this one, right? Trial and error is a possibility. <coughs> you have four choices. So you can actually start off with the five, try the seven. If the common ratio is seven, then multiplying the five by the seven and then by the seven again will get you where you need to go, all right? So that's, that's one way that you could do it. Um, knowing that it's geometric means that you, well, it doesn't really mean anything. It just, it gives you a, more than a leg up. I mean, it's, it's really the key to the whole problem, all right? Because identifying the geometric se uh, sequence as the one where you do the multiplication, not the addition, would actually allow you to wipe out choices three and four immediately. All right, because if you multiply five by 120 or five by 240, you're gonna get something way bigger than 245. And that, that would be for the, even the second term. So those values don't make sense, all right? Another way that you can do it, because maybe the numbers aren't as convenient maybe there's some decimal values, maybe it's not a multiple choice question. Take the 245 and divide it by five and then take the square root of that number, all right? So you do 245, divide it by the five, that gives you a 49, then you take the square root of 49, all right? And the reason why we take the square root is because there's two steps. It takes two steps to get from the five to the 245. If, if they gave us the first term and let's say the fifth term, then it would take four steps. So you take the fourth root, all right? So two steps gives you the square root. If I needed to take 10 steps, I would take the 10th root, all right? So a little bit more convenient that way. Alternatively, alternatively, you could also use a, an exponential regression model, right? Because remember, arithmetic sequences are linear in nature. Geometric sequences are exponential. So if you do exponential regression on the position, so this is the first value, the second value, and the third value. We don't know the second value, but if you know the first and the third, stat, edit, one, three, five, 245. Stack out zero. It'll spit out the function that has this sequence. All right. The B value being the common ratio. So you could do it that way too, but yeah, simple computation. I mean, because there's multiple choice, it's gonna be so so quick to do it just by the trial and error. And it's like, why, why make things more complicated than they need to be? So number 25 is 
the reason why I harp on function notation. Because you should not have to write anything down for this question except for the answer. All right. You type in your function. All right, so what I like to do here is make a little note that I put that in Y1 and then compute Y1 of negative two. So in my home screen, alpha trace Y1, type in the negative two. And you get a negative eight as a result. All right. I know we get a little nervous when it comes to um, showing work. So if you're ever in doubt, show the substitution. All right, so g of negative two would be negative four times negative two squared minus three times negative two plus two, which results in a negative eight you didn't have to do any computation by hand. All right. All right. The key thing to keep in mind is a correct answer to this little statement here. A correct answer with no work shown will receive only one credit. So these are two points. In part two, it's, each question is worth two points. So you want to make sure that you show something aside from just the, the right answer. So technically you could come up with the correct answer without showing any work, but show something so that you get that second point. Why would I, well, you want to put the function into Y1 first and then, then do the Y1 of negative two so that it knows what to plug it into. It depends on the question. Generally, no. Yeah, anything that you that you're considering that that's for your own benefit, you really wouldn't need to put down. All right. So, student is in the process of solving an equation. The original equation and the first step are shown below. What property, you remember those questions? I mean, maybe you don't, it was back in September, October, but properties of equalities, you know, number properties, things like that. So we want to explain why the property is correct. That, that's the key ingredient, that's the second point, all right? So nothing changed on the left side of the equation, but on the right-hand side of the equation, it looks like some terms were moved around, all right? So we went from two minus five a plus seven to two plus seven minus five a. So the seven and the negative five a got swapped, right? Whenever you're swapping terms, you can always bring, you can do that as long as you bring the sign with it, but that's known as the commutative property. All right. So the commutative property allows you to swap terms as long as the signs come along for the ride. All right, so it's basically asking you to justify or explain how you know, and that's it's always a tricky thing, how you know the second equation is equivalent to the first one, All right? So anything that justifies that is gonna be fine, but it has to account for the commutative property, All right? So anything that incorporates the commutative property and justifies it would be fine is what I should say. All right, the signs have to come along with it. So if I, if, 
you can kind of imagine a, a different different question but the same theme where they take just the five a and swap it with the seven so if they wrote two minus seven plus five a that would not be the same all right because the signs didn't come along for the ride and you you could you can write your explanation in everyday speak i mean honestly it took every fiber of my being to not write along for the ride as part of my explanation but you could you could write you could write that on the exam you don't have to use technical terms right anything that gets the idea across is going to be fine as long as it's correct of course uh they always have a question where they just flat out tell you to graph something but most of the time they have a follow-up question let's see if that's the case here yep there we go so on the set of axes below graph the line so I want to get Y alone, whether I'm using the calculator or using my linear equation skills, I want to get Y by itself. So I'm going to divide both sides by two. Every term gets divided by two, All right? So Y is equal to negative three over two X minus one. It's pretty easy to graph this by hand without getting the calculator involved because we have the slope We have the y-intercept. And by the way, you don't have to write any of this stuff. They just want the graph. Very important. And I'll, I'll make a note of this on Schoology. Graphs can be done in pencil, but every other part of the exam has to be done in blue or black ink. Actually, I might have already written that. I'm not sure. But, um, but like, for example, if you write any of this stuff in pencil, it's like you didn't write anything. All right, so you gotta be careful about that. So, but somebody will be there to remind you. Just if you can try to remember, it'll save you some time. Because what'll happen is if you, we've had this before, students will write the entire exam in pencil. Then they leave and we have to call them up and say, we can't grade your paper. You have to come back and trace over everything that you wrote in pen. Usually takes a good 45 minutes. It's not fun because you'll have somebody watching you while you do it to make sure you don't change anything. All right, so definitely don't want to be in that position. Y-intercept negative one, down three, right two, down three, right two, and so on. Go back the other way. We want to fill out the entire graph. Oh, overshot the mark, the mark. You'll have a ruler provided for you. You don't need to make it look picture perfect, but you should at least put some effort into making it a quality graph because nobody's gonna take off credit. Nobody's gonna take off credit because you, you're a terrible artist. Nobody's gonna give you a bonus credit because you're a great artist. But if you're not careful, you might plot a point incorrectly like I almost did. Right, so taking your time and being careful is, is gonna is gonna go a long way. And then you also have to make sure you have a label there. All right, so you can label it with the original function or the modified one, it doesn't make a difference as long as you have a label. Arrows and label, all right. So then this set, uh, the next part says, linear equation contains the point 2K state the value of k. So this is telling us the x value on the graph. So here's the x value of two. If I go down to the graph, that'll get me to this point, which has coordinates two, negative four, k equals negative four. It just said stated, you don't have to justify it. All right, so for this question, they're looking for two things, they're looking for an appropriate graph, line, points, arrows, label, and k equals negative four, right? Everything else is gravy. You don't have to include it, but you're welcome to. Right? There's always a question like number 28. It's, it's generally the most intimidating looking question but it's not overly complicated. 
they give you a formula and they tell you to solve it for some variable. All right, so here it's saying solve the formula for the final velocity VF. So all that means is that your job is to get the VF alone. So everything else goes to the other side of the equation. So A is going to be equal to VF minus VI over T. First thing I would want to get rid of would be the T, because that's the easiest thing to get rid of. So I'll multiply both sides by T. So TA or AT, doesn't make a difference, is equal to VF minus VI. If I want to break up that bond of subtraction, I can do that by using the inverse operation addition. So the opposite operation just if they give you division, use multiplication. If they give you addition, use subtraction, and vice versa. So I'm adding VI to both sides. So TA plus VI, they're not like terms, so you can't actually add them, is equal to VF. And there you go. Okay, so there's really not a lot going on there. Couple of steps, but it's scary to look at because it, it, it it feels like they're asking you to do a whole lot more. Also, you may have noticed, because like this exam it, and the first one I gave you were actually photocopies of the real regions. So the amount of space that you're given on, on, on paper here is the amount of space that you'll be given on the exam. So you'll be given a whole page of paper in some cases and only have to do like two steps of a problem. And you'll be wondering, wait, Am I supposed to do more? Like, you gave me a whole page of paper to work with. Like, am I missing something? This has got to be more complicated. Now, sometimes you have a whole page of space and only like two or three lines of work. Okay, that's just how it, that's just how they do it. They don't want the amount of space that they give you to give you any kind of clue as to how much work you should have. So they just give you the same amount of space for everything. 29, inequality question. Solving for x, we want to get x by itself. So I'm going to subtract a 4 fifths from both sides, 4 fifths x. You can go the other way too, subtract a 3 fifths x. I like to keep, when it comes to inequalities, I like to keep the variable on the left. You know, it just makes more sense to me. You know, so negative 1 over 5 x plus 1 third is less than negative 1 third. I'm going to subtract one third from both sides now. So negative one fifth x is less than negative two thirds. You know, adding and subtracting fractions keep the denominator, combine the numerators. So then I have a choice. I can divide both sides by negative one fifth, or I can just multiply both sides by negative five. All right. I think it's a little cleaner to multiply than it is to divide. Because you could always multiply by the reciprocal and that'll work. That's the same thing as division. All right? So on the left hand side, it cancels to a one, so one X. But because I'm multiplying both sides by a negative, I flip the sign. So less than becomes greater than and I'm left with 10 thirds. Okay. I wrote negative 5, but maybe you want to consider it as negative 5 over 1. Because right? then you could see the, the clear top times top, bottom times bottom relationship. Whenever you divide or multiply both sides of an inequality by a negative, you always flip the signs. Generally, they ask something about rational, irrational numbers, number systems. It's not always framed the same way, but this is a pretty common question. Is the product of two irrational numbers always irrational? And your justification doesn't necessarily have to be, it doesn't have to be verbal. You could just show a counterexample, right? So 
for example, well, first and foremost, you got to know what an irrational number is. So an example of an irrational number would be something like radical 7. All right? Because it's a radical that you can't simplify away. So an irrational number like radical 7 differs from something like radical 4 because radical 4 can be simplified away to a 2. All right. So if I take two unique irrational numbers, so radical 7 and let's say radical 3, and multiply them, I'll get radical 21, which is also irrational. So it makes it seem like, hey, it, it looks like they're always going to be irrational. All right. But what if I take radical 7 and multiply it by radical 7? Then the result is radical 49, which is 7. So this is irrational. This one is rational. All right, my first example here, actually, the, why this is blue is beyond me. My first example here was two different irrational numbers, but they never said they had to be different. They said the product of two irrational numbers. So I showed a case where they were different and I showed a case where they were the same. It's not always rational, all right? Oh, uh, sorry, irrational. Well, it's true the other way too. All right, and here's my justification. I didn't have to write anything beyond that. Not always irrational and this is how I know. All right, but if you want to write a sentence to explain it further, you can. It's just it's not going to get you any more points. I'm not suggesting that you do the bare minimum, but I am suggesting that you focus on what the question is asking you to do. Once you've satisfied the requirements of the question, move on. Maybe that is doing the bare minimum. I don't know. Um, solve. So solving a quadratic. Now, it didn't say to do it algebraically. So you do it any way you want. If you're using a graph and calculator approach, again, you can't just write the final answer. You gotta justify it, all right? So if you're using a graph and calculator approach, draw a quick sketch of the graph, all right? So if we're doing it by hand, I look for a GCF. I got a six, I could pull that out. Set each of the factors equal to zero, but we have a contradiction, six can't be equal to zero, but x squared minus seven can be. If you have a quadratic in binomial form, you can just kind of treat it like a linear equation. Isolate the x, so add seven to both sides. Then take the square root to get rid of that power of two. All right. The only concern for a question like this, and, and really anytime you're solving an equation, it's in your best interest because of moments like this, it's in your best interest to also look at it graphically, even if they tell you to do it algebraically, right? Because this one has to be plus or minus seven because we decided to take the square root. The square root of seven can be negative radical seven, but it could also be positive radical seven. All right, and these would be the exact values. This is my final answer. But if, I, if I'm not in the habit of checking my work, I could run into the issue of just putting the radical seven and losing a point and think the, the worst thing that could happen for a well-prepared student is to answer a question, think you got it right, but you got it wrong. That's the feeling of, hey, I thought I did so good on that test. I don't understand where things went wrong. You know, that's, that's the, the, those little mistakes that if you, if you check your work, you can, you can clean that up, All right? So putting in the original function, well, putting in the original equation as a function, I would write, this is really the same as saying f of x is equal to six x squared minus 42, where f of x is equal to zero. So it's kind of a system of equations that's been split. Well, I'm splitting it apart they put it together. So if I put 6x squared 
minus 42 in for x and put 0 in for y, then I could use the intersection function to come up with the values of x. Right? Radical 7 is in the neighborhood of 2, two and change. Right? So like 2.7-ish. Right? So a standard zoom should be fine. I don't need to see the turning point because I'm looking for the x-intercepts. All right, I'm looking for where it crosses the x-axis, so here and here. Estimates are no good here. They want the exact value for x. All right. So if I do second trace 5, all right, so find the intersection. Second trace 5. Enter, enter, enter. It'll drag me to an intersection point. Now, we have symmetry here. So what I would do is I draw a quick sketch, assuming I didn't want to do it algebraically. Draw a quick sketch. Scale it. and draw little arrows indicating what the solutions are. All right, so this one would be negative radical seven. This one would be positive radical seven, all right? But somehow I have to get from this decimal to that answer, all right? If you go into your home screen second mode and call up the X value, you'll see it in its, well, I'll say its most exact form. It's not really exact, but it looks like an irrational number, a decimal that never repeats and never ends. So what I can do is take this x value, square it. That's what the radicand should be. Right? So you could get it for the, from the trace function, but the algebra in this case wasn't that bad, so I would understand if you were like, yeah, I'm probably going to stick to the algebra on this one. But there are ways of handling it. Once you figure out one, if you recognize that there's symmetry, then you know the other just by negating it. Graph the function. Okay, so this is piecewise. So the first one is h of x, or the first piece, 2x minus 3, but only for x values that are less than 0. So... I want the largest value in the set to be zero with an open circle. And I'll take a bunch of values that are less than that and plug it into that equation. All right. Then I'm going to do the same thing with the parabola. H of x is equal to x squared minus 4x minus 5, but only for values of x between 0 and 5. All right, so you could get it from the, the graphing calculator just by typing it in. Each piece, I like to put them both in at the same time, so 2x minus 3, then x squared minus 4x minus 5. Go to the table. For the first one, I'm only focused on values less than 0, so... Starting at negative 3, I got a negative 9, negative 7, negative 5, negative 3, but negative 3 gets an open circle. So 0, negative 3 with an open circle, negative 1, negative 5. The slope is 2, so you can kind of count it off from there. Oops. Try that again without the oops. The other one is going from 0 to 5. So that's this set of values. Negative 5, negative 8, negative 9, negative 8, negative 5, and 0. So 0, negative 5, closed circle, 1, negative 8, 
to negative 9, back to negative 8, back to negative 5, and up to 0. Smooth curve through all the points. And that would be your graph. All right. I'll just give it a label, h of x, good enough. None of this needs to be shown, All right? That's just for your benefit. When they say graph, they mean graph. They just want the picture, All right? So graph means points, curves, appropriate endpoints, whether it's open circle, closed circle arrows, and a label, All right? <coughs> There's no expectation that you write the entire piecewise function as your label. H of X is just fine. More graphs. Is almost always a system of inequalities question. Okay. This comes down to the shading. So you want to solve each for y in terms of x. So we have 2x plus y greater than or equal to 5. And we have y minus 5 less than 3x. Okay. So for the first one, I'm going to knock off the 2x from both sides. Oh, thank you. make sure I wrote everything else right. So we have y greater than or equal to, you can write it as negative 2x plus 8, or you could just write 8 minus 2x. It doesn't make a difference, right? Well, it does. It makes a difference if you're doing it by hand. It doesn't make a difference if you're getting the points from the calculator, right? So if I'm doing it by hand, I would want to write it like this, because then I could pull my slope and my y-intercept. So plus eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right here, right? Because it's a greater than or equal to symbol, greater than or equal, less than or equal, get solid lines. Less than, or greater than, less than, get dashed lines. All right. The inequality will also give us a clue as to the shading, but for now we'll just focus on the on the type of line. So we have a y-intercept of 8, a slope of negative 2, so we can go in both directions, and we want to give this a solid line. All right. Now the equation of this line is 2x plus y equals 8. The shading is the inequality part of it, right? But the line itself is the boundary of the shading gets an equal sign, right? For the second piece, I'm adding 5 to both sides. Just remember, if you divide or multiply by a negative, didn't come up in this question, but if you divide or multiply by a negative, you'd have to flip the direction of the sign or the inequality. Didn't end up being a case here, but it could be. All right. So 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Slope of 3, so up 3 over 1. Down 3 over 1 to the left. This one gets a dashed line. All right, I'm going to draw it solid and then erase to make it dashed. Right, so. Looks something like that. So now I got to take into account the shading. Right? So if you have greater than, greater than or equal, you shade right or above. All right? And also I got to label this. Uh, y minus 5 equals 3x, right? Right or above. The right part is only if it's vertical. If it's a vertical line, 
less than, less than or equal, you shade left. Again, only if it's vertical or below. Okay. So for the first one, I'm looking at a greater than symbol. So I'm gonna shade above. So that would be all of this area here. You'd have to do it with a pencil, obviously, but. So the other one, is a less than symbol, so we'll shade below. All right, so that's all of this area. Not as green as I would hope, but the where it's double shaded, that's our solution area. All right, so you'd have it, I recommend doing it like this. You know, it's not as attractive looking, but you know, it gets the job done. It's just I have the highlighter, so why not, right? Unfortunately, you can't use the highlighter on the regions. I don't know why. Well, actually, I do know why because um, the state wants. Well, in the past, they've wanted exams to be photocopied and sent to them for an audit, and a uh, highlighter doesn't show up on the photocopy. So, that's the issue. Um, you're to use pencil on the Only on the graphs, okay. yeah. So then they ask if the point 0.18 is in the solution area. So you just plot 1.8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. All right, here's one eight. So no, it falls on the dashed line. Which is not part of the solution area. Dashed line. Right. It would have been fine if it was on the solid line. So at this point, we're somewhere like over here. That would have been okay. That lasted so long. I don't know why I gave out right now. Yeah, but if it, if it was right here, it would have been fine. Because it's on this line. It's part of the set. But because it's on the dashed, it's not in the set. Okay. Number 34, on the day Alexander was born, his father invested $5,000 in an account with 1.2% annual growth rate. Write a function A of T that represents the value of his investment two years after Alexander's birth. Give you a lot of room to write something that you don't need a lot of room for, but this is what it is. We know this as Y of T is equal to A, plus, uh, a times one plus or minus R to the T power. Because it's growth, we're gonna go with the plus. So, and they want us to use A of T instead of Y of T. 5,000 was the initial investment. One plus, this goes to decimal form, 0 0.012. <coughs> to the T power. Right. It was this question that was the inspiration for one of the problems that was on a recent quiz. Right. So determine the nearest dollar, how much more the investment will be worth when Alexander turns 32 than when he turns 17. So what we would figure out is A of 32 minus A of 17. All right. So I would take this and put it in as a, as a function 
5,000 1 plus 0 0.012 to the x power instead of t power. But that gives me the ability in my home screen to use alpha trace to plug in the 32 and then alpha trace again to plug in the 17. All right, so put in Y1, then you do Y1 of 32. Like this stuff you wouldn't write on the exam, but just doing it for note taking purposes. So in or on the, in the home screen. Then they said to round it to the nearest dollar, right? So the exact value is what you see on the screen. This approximates to uh, the nine goes up, so that would be twelve hundred dollars. Right. Just this? Uh, no, including the y one. Oh no, that. Oh, all that extra stuff is fine. Yeah, if it's irrelevant, we don't even look at it. Yeah, it, it's different from like if you're taking a test in you know regular testing class where if you write something incorrect, even if it's irrelevant, you lose credit. So that's enough work. That's enough work. Yeah. All right. So linear regression, correlation coefficient. Most of the time, when they ask a question like this, it's just what you see here. Like they're not asking you to do too much in the way of follow-up questions. Maybe make a prediction here and there, but nothing too crazy. Definitely less elaborate than our, our unit project. All right, so this should be just simple plug and chug. Just always double check your data entry. Yeah, because I'm looking at this and I, I could I could see myself screwing up the 244, 224. I could see myself messing that up. So I just quick double check to make sure. I like to check it in a way that's different from the way I typed it in. So if I type obviously you type it in top to bottom, but I'll check it bottom to top. just to make sure that like I'm not going through the motions like my brain is actively engaged. All right. So linear regression, stack calc 8. All right, so stat calc 8. They're, oh, sorry, I hit the wrong thing. Uh, they're, they're not asking any follow-ups in terms of, you know, predict this or anything along those lines. Just correlation coefficient, linear regression equation, and then talk about what the correlation co coefficient means. So I don't need to store the regression equation, right? But if I did want to do that, it would be alpha trace Y1, right? But here it's not going to be necessary. You'll see I don't have my diagnostics on. The R squared value didn't show up. Again, just a reminder, mode, go down to the one that says stat diagnostics and hit enter on on, then run the regression again. Will they most likely all be on the When you reset your calculator, it automatically gets shut off. Okay. So you'll have to turn it on. you'll have to go to mode and turn stat diagnostics on. Okay. All right, so again, alpha trace Y1 if needed. Calculate, now I have my R squared and my R value. All right, once the exam starts, nobody can tell you how to do that. All right, so if, you're, if your R squared and R values aren't on, then you're out of luck, all right? So, when you reset your calculator, if 
if the proctor doesn't give instructions, they usually give instructions to turn it back on. But if they don't, then raise your hand before the exam starts, raise your hand, have a proctor come over, it'll be a math teacher, and a ask them to remind you how to turn the stat diagnostics, on, the stat diagnostics on. They can tell you before the exam starts, but not during. So is that the only like, thing you should look out for to like, turn back on? Yes. Like, yeah, because everything else is like trigonometry and stuff, which we didn't. And that's the go down stat diagnostics. Exactly. So they say round to the nearest hundredth here. So y equals 246.34 minus 7.76x. The correlation coefficient they want to the nearest hundredth also. So r equals negative 0.88. Then explain why the sign of the correlation co or, I'm sorry, what the correlation coefficient suggests in the context of the problem, All right? So the correlation, the sign of it, aside from the strength, talks about the direction, All right? So this means that there is a negative relationship because they're only asking about the sign. So they're not getting into the strength. So the 0.88 is a, is a pretty strong correlation coefficient but they're not getting into that. They just want to, they want you to address the sign. So we're saying that there's a negative linear relationship but never just leave it at that. Never, a negative linear relationship between what and what, between distance and cost. You don't have to write an essay, but you do have to get the variables in there. So those kind of questions should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, there's multiple steps, but they're, they're all attainable in terms of the points. Uh, 36, snowstorm started at midnight. This is one of those uh, creating a graph from a scenario problem, it was unit four. Snowstorm started at midnight. For the first four hours, it snowed on an average rate of one half inch per hour. All right, so that's a slope is equal to one half. Then the snow, uh, uh, sorry, the snow then started to fall at an average rate of one inch per hour for the next six hours. So the slope now is one. Then it stopped snowing for three hours. So the slope is zero, right, no snow. Then it started snowing again at an average rate of one half inch per hour for the next four hours until the storm was over. All right, so slope again is at one half. So the interval for the storm in, in total is not, it doesn't seem to be very clear, but at least we could get started. All right, in the beginning, there, there was no snow, right? No time, no snow. But then for the first four hours, so here's four, we have a rate of one half inch per hour. So every hour you get half an inch, right? So you can kind of creep up this way if you want. You can do it like this, but you could also do, you know, rise over run, right? So, oh, sorry, one half inch. This is half a unit per hour. Just be careful with the scaling. I almost got got it on that one too. All right. For the first four hours, so that would be this piece, the piece wise. All right. Doesn't seem like they're asking us to write the equation. They're definitely not asking us to write the equation, but they are asking us to make the graph. All right. Then it it stepped up to a slope of one. 
So one inch every hour for the next six hours. So that'll get us to 10. All right, so we're gaining one inch every hour. So that gets us to three after five hours, six, uh, four after six hours, five after seven, six after eight, seven after nine, and eight after 10 hours. So that would be this piece. All right. Then for three hours, no snow. So that gets us to 13. And then back to a rate of one half inch per hour the rest of the way. All right. So I don't particularly like the way they phrase this, but it, they're basically just saying for the next four hours, right? When they say until the storm was over, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, superfluous, right? But half an inch per hour for the next four hours gets us to 17. So two, three, that would be the end of the graph. We would go off the grid after that anyway, so kind of makes sense. But you wouldn't put arrows on it because they say for the next four hours. Yeah, that's talking about the, the, the storm being over, but it's a finite period of time because the storm doesn't go on forever. Right? It's not the end of days or anything. Right? Determine the average rate of snowfall over the length of the storm. Right. So that would be if we went from zero, zero, directly to 1710. Because average rate is another or a more fancy way of saying slope. Slope is rise over run. So change of y over change in x. So 10 minus 0 over 17 minus 0. Terrible handwriting. So 10 seventeenths. All right, so let's get that in decimal form. They said nearest hundredth of an inch per hour. So that's going to be 0.59 inches per hour. So over the better part of a day, you're talking about a little bit more than half of an inch per hour. Doesn't sound like a lot, but that sounds like enough to get you a snow day and a follow-up two hour delay, you know, so that's what we like. All right, and then number 37, the part four question worth six points, so obviously the most involved question. All right, Alyssa spent $35 to purchase 12 chickens. She bought two different types of chickens. Americana chickens cost $3.75 each, and Delaware chickens cost $2.50 each. Write a system of equations that can be used to determine the number of Americana chickens, A, and the number of Delaware chickens, D, that she purchased. So they define the variables for you, so you don't have to worry about a let statement. If they didn't define the variables, then you would have to say let A equal this, let D equal that, All right? So, We have 12 chickens in total and $35 spent in total. So if I take the number of America, Americana chickens and add to that the number of Delaware chickens, that should give me the total number of chickens overall. All right. Because again, A is the number of Americana chickens and D is the number of Delaware chickens. If I take a and multiply it by the price for each of those A values. That gives me the total amount of money spent on the Americana chickens. And then $2.50, 2.5 times D gives me the total amount of money spent on the Delaware chickens. Put it all together, that's the total amount of money spent overall. Keyword here, algebraically. So 
I have to solve this using you have you have, you have your two possibilities. It's either elimination or substitution. When I, I call it being stacked, when the two equations are stacked like this, where the variables line up so they're the same format, I prefer to go with the elimination method, which is to say that I want to multiply one or both equation by some number so that I can cancel out one of the variables. So what I'm going to do is I, I'm just going to make a decision here and say I want to, I want to get rid of the D. All right, so I'm going to multiply the first equation by negative 2.5. Right, so that creates a new equation equivalent to the original. We talked about that before. Anytime you multiply an equation by a numerical value, each term, you get the same equation, just looks a little different. So negative 2.5a minus 2.5d is equal to negative 30. The second equation I'm going to leave as is 3.75a positive 2.5d and 35. I'm going to add the two equations together. All right, so negative 2.5 plus 3.75 is 1.25. The D's cancel. 1.25 is equal, or 1.25A is equal to 5. So then I want to divide both sides by the 1.25. It is possible that you, you get something that's not a whole number, but if that's the case, be on the lookout for rounding instructions. In fact, let the rounding instructions be the key indicator of whether or not you should expect a nice answer. No rounding instructions, I expect a nice answer. So we're looking at four Americana chickens. A plus D is equal to 12. Four plus D, because we now know A is four, meaning D is equal to eight, all right? They ask the question in words, we give the answer in words. There are Four Americana chickens and eight Delaware chickens. All right. So now, again, because it's a part four question, it's more elaborate, so they got a follow up. Each Americana chicken lays two eggs per day and each Delaware chicken lays one egg per day. Alyssa only sells eggs by the full dozen for $2.50. Determine how much money she expects to take in at the end of the first week with her 12 chickens. All right, so they're giving us another rate. All right, so eggs per day multiplied by the number of chickens would give us the number of eggs that the in, in total that those types of chickens would produce, all right? So if I said A, again, is the number of Americana chickens, I, I'll just leave it as a variable for a sec. I would say 2A plus 1D is gonna be equal to, and I'll just make a little note, the number of eggs per day, all right? Now she's only gonna sell eggs by the full dozen, but we wanna know how much she's gonna have at the end of the first week with the 12 chickens, all right? So we know A is equal to four. We know D is equal to eight. So eight plus eight is 16. So 16 eggs per day. All right, take that 16 and multiply it by seven. That first week, we're assumed seven days in the week. So 16 by seven, so was that 112? Yeah. 
So 112 eggs per week. Take that 112, divide it by 12. That's 12 eggs. E eggs has two Gs per dozen. So take that divided by 12. We're looking at nine and a third. So 9.3 repeated. She's only going to do full dozens. So we're going to ignore the 0.3 repeated. So nine full dozens times 2.5 per dozen is what, 22 and a half? Nine times 2.5. Yeah, so $22.50. All right, so that's all they're asking for this, but you never know. Uh, the the follow-up question could be how many how many eggs of each type would need to be produced in order for her to get her original $35 back. You know, to make it so that she didn't have to pay anything for the chickens. All right. So that's another possibility. Um, so that's this region. So I know we wanted to go over standard deviation real quick. So let me just make up a quick data set. So stat edit. Let's say you're given a raw set of data. In fact, what I have here in L1 is perfectly fine. So if you have a raw data set, you can get everything you need statistically, aside from the linear regression stuff, by doing stat calc option one. All right, stat calc one. There's really no good place to write. Oh, you know what? I know where I can write it. Right here. So stat calc one for the mean which is X bar, the sample standard deviation, SX, actually I'll just kind of do it over here. The population standard deviation is the one that has that, it's like an O with a funky tail called Sigma. Then you have the minimum, Q1, median, Q3, and max. Those are kind of self-explanatory. But StatCalc1, tell the calculator where to find the list of data. The default is L1, so you shouldn't have to worry about that. Ignore frequency list, go right to calculate. And that for this set of data, the X bar, the mean is six, the standard deviation for the sample. Take care. So the sample standard deviation is six point, you know, rounded however they say to round it, so 6.616. The population standard deviation, those kind of questions they just flat out ask you. They say, what is the sample standard deviation? Round it to the nearest hundredth or whatever, right? But then right at the bottom, you get all the numbers, minimum Q1, median Q3, and maximum. These are for a box plot. Useful for creating a box plot. All right, so there's never really an instance where you'd have to do any of the statistic stuff by hand. It's all stuff that could be done on a calculator. All right, so if you just use this this process, that's really all all you need.